Hi, everybody. It's Nancy Reyes with For Your Canine. And Joanne Zoyke with For Better, For Worse. And Lisa Bataska with Canine Defined. Hello. I hope you all had a really great uh, weekend with this wonderful weather we're having. Um, <coughs> it's been a hectic week, but uh, but uh, in, a, in a good way. So let us know you're out there. Today, we're going to be talking about confidence and how to build confidence in your dog. So, <clears throat> and this is a kind of a complicated uh, topic. So I think we're going to um, kind of tease it apart a little bit and how to help dogs do it. And I know you've talked, hi, Ronnie. And I know we've talked about it um, over, over the, you know, months and months we've been doing it, but I think trying to elaborate more on it and how to do that in a good way, because I think what happens when we have a dog that doesn't, that lacks confidence, we tend to want to overstress and overface the dog. Um, and that's usually what I mean. I use the word over, overface quite a lot. And that's what I mean by uh, trying to overdo. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about what confidence is and how to help, how to help dogs with more confidence and confidence or lack thereof isn't usually always anxiety ridden. Some dogs just aren't, haven't been exposed or anything like that. So we're not only talking about anxiety, we're talking about just a general dogs uh, and how to help with confidence. And it to, for the different, um, in different areas, right? Cause some dogs may be confident in one area and not in the, in the other. So um, that's kind of how we're going to chat about that. <clears throat> anything you guys want to add? <clears throat> No, I think um, breaking down, like it's it's not just a, my dog's confident or not. You can have confidence or lack thereof on a lot of different items or scenarios or types of things, right? So um, I think when we talk about this, it's important to know like the context of it, right? Yeah. And just like some people are not generally confident about a lot of things, that some dogs are like that, or some dogs are confident in certain areas and not others, right? So <clears throat> um, as a business owner, I have confidence in certain areas of my work and other areas I don't. So I try to hire people that have confidence in those areas because I lack it, right? Or I don't have time to build confidence in it. So, <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is really go over some definitions so we're real clear about it. Um, and it's really, this is a real simple slide thing, nothing fancy, it's real clear. What confidence is, it's a feeling or consciousness of one's own powers of reliance on one's circumstances. So that that's true for dogs, right? It's, it's being able to figure stuff out or are reliant on themselves to do that. So that's how you build confidence in people and dogs, okay? <clears throat> so it's just, I just want to be real clear for all of us on the meaning of what it is. Cause I think in dogs, uh, wouldn't you agree you guys that sometimes what we think is confidence isn't mm -hmm. right. Yep, for sure. Isn't, especially those of us who do dog sports. It's a, it's a very, I don't think it's very clear what it means. Right. Um, and, and how to, and, and also <laughs> Effects on how we have relationships with our dogs, not understanding of what confidence means. Right? <clears throat> so that's number one. Number two, I wanted to talk about mutable, right? Confidence is one of those things we can change in a dog. We can make that better. Um, being a sociable dog or over aroused or energy are not mutable. You cannot change those. Those are, are what they are. You can you can make them better with some training, but they're, you're not changing it deep down. You're just <clears throat> adjusting things. But confidence is the, one of those that can be changed over time, and done properly, it can change. It could it could really make a difference for the dogs. So I just want to be clear when we talk about mutable that confidence is one of the few things that are that you can make a difference and you can change in the dog. Okay. Um, I think that's it for now. I just wanted to talk about that a little bit. I, I have more, a couple more slides, but <clears throat> we can incorporate those as we go. Um, so I just wanted to be clear what the defi what definitions we're talking about and that we are able to change it. 
Um, we can make it better or we can make it worse, but we're, we're able to, to make that change. So, uh, and again, we're not only talking about anxious dogs. We can have a very confident dog that's, that worries about a certain aspect. Like, I'll be honest, my lab is a pretty confident dog, but she's not super, super confident, always, always on new flooring. She can hesitate for a minute. Even though most people don't notice it, I notice it. I know that she'll hesitate or she'll take a minute to work through that uh, piece of it. So she's not super confident on a lot of uh, flooring uh, and things like that. So those are one of the things. That's that's an example, right? She's not anxious. She's just not super confident on different floorings, right? And again, most people would notice it. I notice it because I know I you know I know the diff you know I see the difference. But she's doing really well. And you, you know, she kind of works through it pretty quickly, but she's not real confident on a lot of different surfaces, just who she is. She's been that way since she was a puppy. <clears throat> Granted, she's more confident on more like gym floors and with nose work and all that, but she's, you know, not as confident, uh, you know, when it's uh, something weird or if it moves, she's less, a little less confident. Um, okay. So uh, I think Joanne and Lisa were kind enough to uh, have video on different things. So um, what are we going to start with, you guys? Um, Lisa, your cattle dog was what? There was a, I presented with novel stimulus. So I ended up um, first getting her. I noted in my head when I saw certain things that different things, but... Um, very environmentally aware and a little sensitive with people, um, not super confident, that type of stuff. And then, um, so I thought it was interesting. So when March of 2020 hit and we went into kind of lockdown and all the pandemic stuff, I ended up like just playing with her to figure stuff out and watching body language to determine who she was, what I needed to work on and how I needed to proceed with her. So Mm -hmm. And uh, Lisa hit the nail on the head on that. Being able to read your dog is the number for the first thing you have to do to be able to work on confidence, whatever that may be, right? Reading your dog correctly, that it's a lack of confidence and it's not anxiety and all those things. So that is number one, right? That is key. <clears throat> so um, in this particular video that Joanne's going to put up, what I did was I had a treat and train and I was just wondering how she would react um, to something stimulus, some novel stimulus. So it was a visual plus a auditory component to it to see if she could, how she could recover, what she looked like, you know, if I supported her, what did that look like? And I think a lot of times too with confidence, when we are working with dogs, um, you know, we want to counter condition and um, counter condition. What? Sorry, somebody touched okay. me. Um, counter condition and desensitize, right? So we think about training and when we think about training it, um, there's a difference between training it and then also understanding who the dog is. And in her case, um, I understood what the sensitivity is. And I think a lot of times too, what happens with people, um, we want to hurry up and help them get past stuff. And when we do um, try to help them get past it. Sometimes our intent is too much for the dog. So I've seen it work count. It's balanced. It goes the opposite direction, right? So in one situation, I was working with a, a, um, client who had a dog who was a little sensitive to say the vacuum cleaner. And I said, okay, we'll break it down. Um, is it the motion? Is it the sound? What about just the visual stimulus of it sitting there? And so then what happened was um, that particular person had tried to counter condition and desensitize it. But with the breed she had, which was a highly sensitive um, herding breed, it was a Malinois, that particular dog was like, why do you want me to look at that? That's kind of creepy. You know, do I look at it? Don't I? What happens? And why are you making it a big deal? Why are you making it a thing? So I think it, it, it's kind of difficult and you really have to watch the body language of the dog to determine is this a thing for you? Because I think sometimes we make it a thing when it shouldn't be a thing, right? And then we we actually, it's counterproductive. We end up making it, sensitizing them to it when we really want to be like, it's not a thing. But the dogs are like, but you're making it a thing. So uh, that's very interesting to me. And I think there's, you know, I think sometimes one of the things I'm finding as I as we go along and stuff, that sometimes the how isn't as important as the why. 
and the why helps us sort through right what who the dog is you know what i mean versus it's not a matter of how to train it it's about why is it important right for both the dog and the human and um kim just hit it kim just uh, mentioned something that i wanted to touch upon um flooding yes it is still widely used by very, very. meaning people and flooding is basically like if you're afraid of spiders is, you know, having you be near a whole bunch of spiders and just getting over it. And sometimes flooding for both people and dogs can be really bad. Uh, really, really bad. Because we tend to want to flood them. You just want them to get over it. Well, they determine when they get over it. That's it. Mm -hmm. You. Right. right. And so sometimes you have to go go slow to get there fast is usually, uh, it, it, is a, it is a true statement. <coughs> um, yep. and I'm gonna um, I'm gonna ask Lisa that cattle dog video is private if you can adjust the oh, security geez, settings. Sorry. So um, one of the sense. things that I wanted to mention because you know I'm a big like human analogy tied to dogs type of person, so I want to throw it out there, right? And <clears throat> you could talk about it as fear or confidence either way, but um, if you if you have children or you were as a kid ever afraid of the dark, right? It's one of those really common things in kids. And I ask my students sometimes, right? Like, what do you do? What do you do to make your kid not afraid of the dark? And you're like, well, I, I can't. Right, you can't. What you can do is aid, right? Assist, build confidence in things like, how about if I leave the door cracked? How about if I check under your bed and in the closet? How about if I have, leave a nightlight on, right? All of those types of things, you're helping to make it, more okay versus like, ah, I'm shutting the lights off. You deal with it. Right. Which could be better or worse. Um, mm -hmm. But, and in the end, right. When you ask, well, how did you get over being afraid of the dark? And you're like, I don't, I don't know. Like it just happened one day. And that's, it, that's what happens a lot in dogs. Right. I don't know what I did. I just know I was there to support and assist and, you know, try not to do anything that would further, frighten the dog or reduce confidence. And then one day it just got better. Right. Yeah. So, yep. um, and, uh, Pilar asked about, uh, somebody's dog, her friend's dog thinks the car is the butcher and you can, yeah. And I would say feeding her next to the car only if it's, if, she, if her body language you and Pilar, you might ha have to end up starting a little further away is get, how does she look when she's getting near the car? If she's already stressing, then you might start, you know, 10 feet away or 20 feet away, then eventually move that closer. That's a good idea because it helps uh, create that positive association. But make sure that the distance that you're asking the dog to do that in is going to be, a, you know, comfortable for the dog. So it might right. be 10 feet away, 20 feet away, or maybe the dog's fine as long as she's not going in the car, right? But you might have to figure out what that space is where the dog's comfortable. And then, like I said, you can do that and it'll go quick, quicker versus trying to push it. You know what I mean? So it's really. So uh, being, I'm sorry. So being devil's advocate, like you said, Nancy, we were talking the other day about fear periods. So that's an important thing to know, right? So the the dog, the Malinois, for example, and then the car issue. Uh, so it was interesting. So I had a, another client I was working with who had a, a Sheltie. You know, we all know Shelties are super highly sensitive. By the way, Joanne, that's, I fixed it. So whenever we're done. I saw. Yep. So what happened was um, she would walk the dog towards, like at her house, she would walk the dogs towards the, um, towards the street. In the street, the cars were zooming past. It was kind of a busy street. And so I said, you know what? Stop that stop it altogether, go somewhere else, change the context for the dog. And she did, she went to a new park and so forth. And she stopped asking the dog to do that because the dog would compress. The body language was like, I'm not comfortable. I go, you need to knock it off. And so then um, she did that. And then he got a little older, a little different experience in a different context. What wasn't closer to home because highly sensitive. Right. And and now she's like, did you know I can walk him closer up and he's better and stuff like that? I'm like, that's interesting. But age is an issue as well, continue, right. considering where the dog is. So on top of the fact that if they're going through a fear period, we also have to consider 
physically is a dog in pain. They did a 2000, they did a study in 2018 with noise sensitivity. I don't know if you guys have heard of that noise sensitivity and, um, chronic pain, it actually gets worse as they get older. And to be yeah. to be realistic, I mean, it makes sense, right? In the in the wild, and granted, we, these are domesticated animals, but they still have a genetic issue or component to this. In the wild, if an animal is, um, is, is injured or not feeling well, they're more vulnerable to be picked off by a predator. So, you know, those are things we have to consider. We have to look at the entire dog and who they are age is an issue, who they are, what their learning experiences are, you know, all those things are a factor and paying attention to body language because that's truly going to make a difference. Yeah. And Pilar, I think Harper might be in a fear period. And sometimes mm -hmm. when they're in those, just letting it be for a while yep. and then <clears throat> going back to it after she's done uh, will make a huge difference. But Absolutely. again, making sure that where you start asking her to eat by the car is going to be comfortable for the dog. So it might be 10 or 20 feet away or even more, but that's where you'd start where the dog is comfortable and then go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think just to clarify even farther, what Nancy said, right? Comfortable means the dog isn't picking off the food. The dog is eating like they would eat inside at their food bowl. Right. right. So right. it looks normal. It's oh. not, it doesn't look like, Oh, let me grab some and take it over here and eat it. That, that right. types of stuff. Right. That would be, that means it's food close. Meaning the dog can be like, okay, the car's over there, but I can still eat over there. Right. Fluid motion. Right. You know, the mouth, the mouth pressure may not be hard, depending if you have a lab like Nancy's, you know, that kind of stuff. So, you know, taking the skin off as I eat, that's normal. So it totally depends. Yeah, totally depends yeah. on the dog. All right. You ready for your cattle dog? Ready. Ready. All right. Let's do this. Do, do. All right. So there I was providing support. She was checking it out. There's food in there and she's foodie, right? And that's the other thing we have to realize, like we can put them totally in conflict. So what does that mean, right? Foodie and in conflict. The dog's willing to um, engage. Fight, yeah. Fight a fear because they like the food better, right? Which I think is what humans need to be super careful about. Yep. Because we can definitely make it... Worse for the dog. So she, cause some dogs like, you know, some dogs will walk through fire for a cookie. Right. But even watch her motion. So yep. I went ahead and I clicked it. You could tell the second I clicked it, it makes yep. noise. Cause this she's is like, a long yeah. yeah. He backed up, but she went forward. And if you notice, she's always been like this. Like she's always been when she's uncertain because yeah. I've provided her support. She will touch me. She's like, Oh mom. But look at the stretch. Mm -hmm. Right. So back to Pilar, if the dog is stretching to eat like that, it's too much. Too right? much. <coughs> and so the, the what Lisa's doing, I want to really talk about because this was an old theory. Don't coddle them. Don't. Yeah. Yeah. Right. What she's that's not coddling. Right. That's like, hey, you're all right. I got your back. Right? right. She's not saying, oh, it's OK. Don't worry about it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> right. That can also make it worse. She's just putting a nice, gentle hand on her, letting her know, I got your back. Don't worry about it. Yep. And she see how she approached it a little more square here. Then she's like, right. make it do. But I don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. But and, and here's the other thing, like, even though she was asking at that point, did you see the startle reflex yeah. and then the forward? So like it initially, like she wanted the food to come out, but she's in conflict. She wanted it to come out, but then she's like, I don't know, mom, it's kind of crazy. And I completely supported that. So, and, and like Joanne said, I think people don't know the difference between coddling, right. And supporting there's a difference. This is coddling. Cause he's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think too, like when, well, when we do things, it's important, right? So the dog had its nose up the treat hole, right? <laughs> come on, come on, make it go. That's not the moment I would make it go, right? No. Mm -mm. That's why I withheld. Yep. And I waited for her to like anticipate a bit. And then I would go ahead and she's like, even then I was, she saw, she's like, are you sure? And I'm like, okay, well, 
I did make it happen at that point because her body language, even though she wasn't exactly where I wanted to be, I wanted her to like be okay. So like, this is the thing that's hard and it frustrates me because I think like people think that at that point, well, she took the cookie, but it doesn't mean she feels safe, right? This is, safety is a thing. I mean, people, you can't, if a dog, all of the other needs are met, then you you look at Maslow's Eric needs, all the other needs are met. The next step is safety, then relationships. I had to, this was like, it took a little while to get to this point with this dog because I noticed that she was a little more sensitive. And you know what? That's okay. I, I accepted who she was. And for me, I was like, yeah, I could work with this. I don't have a problem with it. You know, um, now granted in other situations, she's much more forward, but that for just because she's forward in other situations, she's still uncertain as she stepped past me and I'm still supporting her saying it's not a big deal. And when I moved my foot, she turned and looked at it and then she's like, okay, as long as you're here, we might be okay. So, yeah, it, you know, she, um, and one of the things I want you to notice when she's okay and she's feeling better about it, her body's a lot more square, mm-hmm. stretching, no compressing. It's, it's a little more square and a little more comfortable. So that's really important. Yep. And even the moment when she actually threw in a sit there, right? She was like, oh, okay. When they're going to be stationary for you, it's they're not ready to bolt, right? All right. And she's so then I, this really yeah, and so I pro- Yeah. And so I progressed it. I pushed it a little further away. I said, hey, can you do this on your own away? Kind of like back when um, Joanne was saying, like what Suzanne says, how's this for you? Can I, if I push it away, now that we've got a little bit of understanding, you know, I'm here. And I could tell like right there, compression, a startle, but she was able to go forward. She turned, she kind of did a little head check back to me and stuff. And I'm like, okay, I'm here, but she's still in a wide stance. If you look at her position of her feet. So, and then I'll lean in right there. Right. And she's like, I don't know. Yep. And the stretch. Right. So she's not entirely comfortable. And by the way, I'm sitting here describing this as we go along in the video and then she decided to turn around and go check the other side well, what if i go to the other side what happens here right <laughs> oh yeah she's like come on crazy with the thumbs Are but you, you see the the important thing is you guys this is what she's figuring it out on her own with support Yes. And it's, you know, she's not going to be like, this is fine. No problem. Right off the bat. It's going to take her some time. And this was, was this the first session, Lisa? Yes. Your- well, no, this wasn't, this was the first session. I thought I would do a thing because I'm always interested in body language and trying to exhibit stuff. Right. So in her case, I was like, I wonder, and I knew she was a little sensitive sen- and sensitive environmentally because I saw that initially. But then I'm like, after I developed a relationship with her where she could depend on me and trust me, then I decided, hey, what if we do this? Can you do this and be okay with me supporting you with it? Right. So, so and this is where um, you want to... You- you, you might have a little bit of that <coughs> compression and leaning in, but, but overall you don't want a lot of that. If right. it continues, you would, you would have changed, you know, you would have changed something else. So it's really and important I, that you think, look at, see that. Right. Uh, and the I other think, thing, go ahead. But the, the dog on her own continues to approach, right? She's not like, what about this? It's okay. Come see. Right. So right. the dog is like, that's scary, but give me a second. I think I can work it out. Sure. Mm-hmm. The the other thing I think what's important is that I'm not jabbering. I'm talking in a natural tone because I'm explaining what's happening and why I'm doing what I'm doing. And I also gave her a break because I stopped the pressure of, of hitting the button and then let her move away and figure stuff out. She went to the window. She moved further away. And then she's like, hey, what are you doing? What's happening? And I'm just supporting her. And then she's like, are we done? I'm like, we're done. And I ended it where she was like, but I want more, right? And her body language was smoother and so forth. And I think we push too much. I think it's it's a habit because we are so interested in the end result. And it can't be because, you know, it's not fair to sacrifice the dog for our own goals. Truly. 
It, and, it just isn't. And then sometimes it's never, it's never resolved. See, yes. I, I am the kind of person that I want things to be resolved and it's done. Right. So with the, for the dogs, I try to, that's why I'll go slow and I'm very patient so that then we don't have to keep going and revisiting it over and over and over again. Right. right? We don't have to keep going back and rehashing it and doing it over and over again. Right. So you want it. That's why if you take your time the first time, then it's 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 resolved, right? It's not a big deal then, right? Right. <clears throat> um, the other. I'm sorry. Ahead. The the other thing I wanted to point out is that she was off leash. Okay, right. that's a big thing. So another thing that happened, there was a dog that I had got called in to check and see. They provided video. The dog was jumping. And when he was jumping, I was like, that dog's not jumping right. Okay. It was a square. It was a square dog, like um, in terms of structure. So it didn't have a tight turn when it was doing agility. And they're like, well, he keeps cutting out. And I'm like, there's a reason for that. There's something going on that we need to look at. So I said, please send video or give me video. Well, it turned out when the dog was jumping, what I noticed was that when it pushed off its right side, it's, it's um, sorry, it's left front, left rear, it would kind of do a wide turn and then cut out. And, and I was like that. And then I had them gait and move. And I was like, that dog is not okay. I think the dog is in pain. And it was not a very old dog. And um, I think a lot of times we misinterpret. The, the other thing that's a big issue is, of course, pain, right? So, this particular dog had an issue with that particular thing. And then they, then, and then the other thing they wanted me to look at was they wanted me to go to another location to see how the dog responded. They're like, well, in this environment, but again, pain exacerbates behavior period. So what we did was he opened the doors and they said, this is a hard place for the dog to be. And so the surface was different. Like you were talking about with jive, Nancy, mm -hmm. and the dog had, like I said, take them off leash. I said, hey, when you take them in, is the dog, um, how does the dog do? Like when you took them in, did you take them on leash? Yes, we did because it was too much for him, everything that was going on and he cut out. So they said, oh, sensitize him. So some of the advice that was given to them in a, in a very um, innocent manner, right? take them and sensitize the dog to different environments. Well, what happened was they were intention unintentionally flooding the dog mm -hmm. and they had the dog on leash and the dog had no autonomy or freedom of choice to move away. And I think with the best intentions, we don't consider that. And, and this is why, as we all, the three of us know, um, reading body language is of the utmost importance to help us determine which way to direct to head with our dogs. It's so important. And we were talking about this the other day, Nancy, how it is a passion to help people understand how to read a dog, because this is the only way that we're going to get better for our individual dogs, right? And helping them through life. It is critical. Yeah. So, and and anyway. one of the things that uh, flooding has done so much with most well-meaning people um, I, you know, I had somebody bring in a puppy from a rescue, Malinois puppy, and the puppy was very scared and they just kept him there. Well, he'll get used to it. No, no. that's not how you do it. Right. Cause it can, especially when they're puppies, it can create a lot of other problems that you did, you may not have had that you will have <coughs> after, you know, after this situation, right. It might get, things might get worse. Might, especially when it comes with a, it comes to a dog that's afraid of people. It's a pig. It's, it's a huge situation. If you make that worse, that's going to just be bad all around right. um, for the life what of the dog. Good segue to my videos. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um, so, so yeah, so I took in a foster dog a week ago and um, again, they, these people hired another trainer and the trainer gave them advice. I will call it that. Um, <laughs> The dog growled at people. Um, and so he had a pinch collar on. And then if he didn't quit growling, they came behind his head with an air can, right? An air corrector can and basically scared the bejesus out of the guy. So he was, from what I was told, he was adopted out at four months and he was a little nervous around people and things at that point. 
And so now he he's, you know, lunged at a nipped a kid and they were going to put him to sleep. And I did an evaluation on the dog and I was like, oh, my gosh, I'm like, all this dog wants to do is just move away. That's all he wants to do. And, um, you know, people are like, are you sure? Are you sure? Because, you know, dogs that nip. And I was like, listen, the dog. Yeah. Any dog will nip. I know, you know, one of mine that I have, the border collie that I have, if you corner her and or you do something really unpleasant, she will absolutely snap in your face. Um, and she probably would connect if you hurt her or she couldn't get away. Right. And um, it, it's just, would she be good in a home with kids? Nope. Right. <laughs> I know. And that's just like this guy, right? He would not be good in a home with children or he would not be good in a home that has a lot of company, right? Because mm -hmm. that is just too much for him. He's He'll be totally fine. He's a love in the house. You would never know there's anything wrong with him. He licks Aww. your face. He's totally fine. So um, I did um, some of Suzanne's treat retreat and um, we got to the point now where we're working with other people. So this is not the first session that he's had. I did a lot with him um, before this. Um, but what I want to really let you guys see first um, is before I even let him go. Oh, let me turn the volume off here. Okay. Before I even let him go. Shake. Yeah. Well, what do you guys see? Right? Wagging tail, orienting to people, jumping. Yeah, but it's not a it's not a happy jump. It's a oh and shake off. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. If you look at this, it's very mm -hmm. nervous, right? Please help me. Right. It's, That's yeah, please help me. This is too much. Yeah. And he is not interested in going to the people. So right off the bat, he his choice is not to go. Right. And that's autonomy and freedom of choice, right? That's I mean, could you do that again, Joanne? Yep. He he is uh, not interested in engaging with um, those people in any way or shape or form. So, and they are right there. He looked at them like, hi, guys. Oh, too much. Help me. Too much. Right. Too much. Yep. And so already right off the bat, even though this is not the first session, three people is too much for the dog, right? <clears throat> so it's just information, not good or bad, just information. One person might have been better, would be maybe better. I don't know. It could be the same, right? right. But, and then he goes in with head low sniffing, right? Displacement right. or I don't know how to deal with this. I'm trying to assess and homeostasis to try to recapture myself. Yeah. Everybody needs to calm down. Relax, you freaks. Right. <laughs> right. So then... Um, let's see. So the, the very first time he goes in, I want you to watch his body. Oh, there. Stretchy. The leaning. Yeah. Did you see when she moved her hand, he kind of backs up and comes forward. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Too much. Too much. Sniff. I, Joanne, help me. <laughs> yeah. And he's, he's trying yeah. The sniff, not, no, the dog did not know those three people. First time right. he'd ever met them. So, um, you know, he's trying to check her out. And she, she did, if you notice, she tried to throw food a couple of times. And the dog was like, I can't move away. Right. So he was stuck kind of sniffing her. He didn't know how to get out of there. So if you watch um, her hands, she throws one. She. The second yeah. person throws another one. She Still stretching. One. Yeah. Yep. He's like, oh. And, and the clue is, and the clue is, is that even though he might be foodie, she tossed the food and he was so over threshold, he could not even recognize that food there. Right? right. Yep. All right. And then, so as he starts working a little bit, with people. Now he's got food on the radar. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now that he understands there's food being involved here, now it'd be really easy to try and get him to come in and, oh, here, have a cookie. But that's not what we're trying to do, right? As he comes in to investigate, okay, now go away. You release the pressure. Right. Right. And he goes, oh, oh, thank goodness. Right. Yeah, too much. Yeah. So they learn how to do that on their own, which is why they're off leash. Why right. he's off leash. And he and comes in 
awfully close, but he is not looking for engagement from the person, which is what we really misinterpret so much with dogs. Well, we put them in conflict, right? Because I have something you want, come closer and you can have it. Then I'm going to touch you. Oh, crap. The spider's wanting to touch me. Right. And even still, like this little guy, three people is just too much. Yep. So, <clears throat> but it's just, right? It's information. And then you would just make adjustments accordingly. All right. And Sue, yeah, this is what I mean. Um, <coughs> with Rambo, the hairdryer. He never, he never got to see you do the hair dryer. He was a little freaked out. Then he was barking, pulling away. Then stop, let him touch it, and just sometimes it's it's really simple depending on what the what the object or what the situation is, right? But in this case, this dog is, you know, he's worried. He worries a lot about people, so right. it's slower but, is better when it comes to this stuff. But also, this speaks a lot to his who he is, his self, his. Right who his mm -hmm. being is right so he's not he is not as socially tolerant as some other dogs rambo the other day we were working with rambo and then a dog went after another dog and sue's like oh 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 and then she moved away and then rambo's like what ha what just happened what's going on and he recovered quicker than sue did right sue <laughs> so i was like sue relax take a drink you're good <laughs> you know so like sometimes like Rambo's a nice dog. Like he has a really, there's things about him that are really cool. Right now he's just a naughty teenager who is very distracted by butterflies. But overall he has a really good, he has yeah. a really good bounce back. And that is, that is who he is. That is genetic. There are certain things again, as we go back to temperament um, that we can adjust and other things we can't. So yeah. Anyways. I mean, in confidence, you can make this dog, <laughs> this dog Joanne has a little bit more confident around people, but it's going to take a long time right. right, for him to be. And his social tolerance, meaning he's not going to tolerate a lot of grabbing and all that. So, right. if you, you you know, matching him in a home with somebody like me would be horrible because I am touchy, crabby and cuddly. I am. And so mm -hmm. a dog like that would hate it. <laughs> you know what? Here's the funniest part about this dog. He is he doesn't mind it. You can no, not with somebody he knows. Nope. I grab his collar. I smush his face all the time. Like, and he doesn't because care he, at all. And it's a trust issue, right? Going it back is. to mammals, Eric it needs. He feels safe. Once he feels yep. safe, he has security. Then he can form relationships. It's right. like yep. going up that level, right? So, yep. and that's something we miss. We like, well, I feed you. I take care of you. But do you have a relationship with a dog? That's ultimately it. And the dog is looking for feedback and information from you. Am I okay? Is Are we safe? And he's learned that with you. And then it's hard because now when we go to place these dogs that are a little more particular, mm -hmm. they're not going to fit every home, right? I mean, I could be fine with, I actually, I kind of like those dogs. I'm like, that's cool. I can handle that, you know? All right. You don't have to love everybody. So yeah. But even in that first session, it was maybe 12 minutes and there was three or four breaks in 12 minutes. We took three or four breaks. Mm -hmm. And so if you just look at his body language at the end here. Yeah. Much better. How much smoother, right? He's not stretching really anymore. He's a little hesitant, but he's That's not right. stretch. Like you said, reaching for that. Yeah. Right. No, he, he is still very hesitant around the people for sure. But he's not yeah. worried about those particular three people, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, that was so, and that's how you saw. And with um, and with a dog like, like what's his name, Joanne? His name's Roscoe. Roscoe. Ugh. I keep forgetting a dog like him. You would you would peel it back all the way to one person until that's real. That looks a different, it's better, and then you would add a second person, and then so on, um, because he's still not. Like he's still very hesitant. So I would, so you see what I mean? You want to eliminate all that, no hesitation whatsoever. Um, so while we got rid of the stretching, the hesitation is still there, right? Because it's just a number, it's just too many people. So you would want to pair it. So that's what, this is what the process is and getting to read your dog is learning going, okay, this is still, it's better, but it's not best, right? So you would then adjust to it to make it best for the dog, right? And, and, and I think, 
sometimes we think, oh, it might be okay. And then it's not. We, you know, as trainers, that happens all the time, right? <clears throat> Go ahead. I think that, um, like, first of all, like to me, first and foremost, your relationship with your dog is of utmost importance. Your dog has to trust you. Once you get that trust, then you can start adding challenges and then adjusting. Oh, too much. And it's okay to fail, right? It's okay to say, oh, that was a little too much. I'm going to back it off a bit and see if I get a better response. And, you know, we are pushers. We are pushers. And it's, it's, it's not great for the dogs, but by the, by the grace of God, they, um, they accept it and they're tolerant because, you know, we've bred them to be sociable with us for the most part. So I think in that particular case, it's information. And so like moving forward, you might address, adjust it a bit like, um, you know, cause I've pushed, I've totally pushed and I'm like, whoops, that's sorry, my fault. Let's just move over here. Pay right. no attention to that, you know, and 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 so then when that happens, I, I feel bad. But then I'm like, OK, note to self, we're going to adjust. Right. And, right. and and learn from that. That's that's the most important thing is don't beat yourself up over it because we do happen to push a bit. So, you know, yeah. and that was really and that's what I mean. And so while that looked better, you want to do best, especially when it comes to people. Right. The people thing is best. You want the best because that you want that lasting, lasting, lasting change so that you can find the dog a home where he's going to stay. Right. Especially since he's been bounced around for, you know, already at how old is he? Uh, he's 14 months old. <coughs> and this is a third. No, he was adopted out at four months and then he was only with one home. So. But, and the other thing too, is like, accept him for who he is, right? Accept him for who he is, right? He's not going to be, if somebody says, Hey, I want this dog and he's so cute and I, he's going to be a therapy dog. I'm like, you're no. high. You are high. Let it go. Right. It's not fair. I want to take him to all of my kids' games. No. Yeah. Right. So, no. Was he born in the shelter? Uh, I don't know where they got him okay. from. Okay. Okay. So you don't know his, you don't know his. I like could probably was, find out, but in the end, born. it's like, does it really matter? I mean, right. well, yeah, it does. It, it does matter because especially when they're that young, it doesn't matter so much when they're older, but like, where did he, did, was he born in the shelter? Was he born, was he an owner surrender? Was he, cause then you know what the puppy, if you can, you don't, we don't always get to know that those things. Right. Uh, if we can know like what kind of, socialization did he get when he was a young puppy right um did he get any did he get you know what i mean just information it doesn't it's not going to change who he is but it just gives us a kind of a from a trainer perspective like okay why what did he miss in his whatever was it genetics was it lack of you know was he born in a shelter because sometimes that's that makes a difference um or, and sometimes it doesn't. So for puppies, I, I really do want to know more. For adult dogs, uh, it really doesn't it doesn't matter. It's not going to change a thing, right? Um, <clears throat> so what other videos you got? <laughs> um, let's see. Lisa has an enrichment one, and I have one of fire, the difference. It's nose work related. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So Lisa, do you want to talk about your enrichment video? Yeah. So, um, one of the things, so I don't know if you guys know, there's a, um, free work. Have you heard of free work? It's free work. Um, and it's enrichment basically. So it's Sarah Fisher and she creates like, um, basically it's like autonomy. The dog's off leash. You have the dog in a small room. You have different options for the dog to do where they get the autonomy off leash to do stuff. And it does help with, um, confidence so you can adjust surfaces and different things and so forth and that's pretty interesting um i thought so like in the um in the shelter we do a lot of enrichment we try to do as much enrichment as possible right and it's all relative to who's accessible who's able to help and enrichment can be so like um you can take a box and you can put um, like a scent of vanilla, um, a little bit of swipe of mint, um, a little corner smudge of um, peanut butter. And then another corner you can do like um, um, 
uh, cream cheese. And then in that, you can take like paper towel rolls, put some treats in it, close it up. Um, and then think about affecting all the senses, like visual, auditory. So like, um, it's kind of like when um, Suzanne or anybody like Suzanne and Avidog, when they do temperament testing, they'll have different stations, so to speak. So the dog has free choice. The difference is in a temperament test, you kind of ask the dog, hey, if I ask you to do this, will you do this? Whereas in free work, they get to do it of their own volition. So, and it's all off leash, it's by choice, free autonomy. The dog gets to spend whatever time and that activity of, you know, there's a thing where they actually have, you know, a, a novel sense actually light up different parts of the brain. And it actually helps these dogs kind of build some confidence. I can do this on my own without pressure. And I think a lot of times we add too much pressure by physically saying, go check this out. Go look at that. How about this? And sometimes it's just a matter of let the dog be a dog. Let him dog. Let him learn. Let him do stuff. So um, Sarah Fisher talks about free work and it's from the UK, UK and it's pretty interesting. And I've seen um, Dr. Kim Brophy, who's an ethologist. Um, she does behavioral stuff. And like when the people come in, she has that all set up for the dog. So then she can sit and freely talk to the person about what's going on. So it is very interesting about that particular piece, but it's just autonomy, right? Without direction. And I think um, that does help dogs because sometimes we make it a thing. And when we make it a thing, it becomes kind of like the elephant in the room, pay no attention to the dog behind the curtain, right? And that that's a little difficult. Like some dogs don't handle that pressure very well. So anyway, in this case, we did some enrichment because, so this is Lacey, you're gonna see. Lacey was older here. She has spondylosis in her back end. And um, years ago when she started doing a um, nose work, I'm sorry, um, she loved obedience. And so what I noticed was that she had a hard time sustaining her sit. Do you remember this, Nancy? And we yeah. went to a seminar and one of the recommendations was to take the leash and put it behind her to see if maybe it was a security issue. No, she was suffering from a physical ailment and that was a problem. So what I did was I put stuff around and so we have different surfaces and different things and I put treats in different places. She is foodie, but watch her how she moves. She's going to tell you that some of this stuff is uncomfortable. She's already stiff. Um, so this is an older dog that pain is exacerbating some of the inability to kind of check things out. Oh, Lacey. I know. I miss her so much. She was like the best dog, even though she was such a witch. I adored yes. her. She was a hag. <laughs> She was, but she was so good with the dogs, man. She was so good with puppies. She was very clear. Was it her knees, Lisa? Um, she's not moving well. The spinal spondylosis. Okay. So her back end. So, like, I noticed that she wouldn't sit, and I'm like, hmm. But you can tell she's very stiff in movement, right? She's not um, moving very nicely as much as I like, but... And here, and then she's looking at stuff and sniffing out. So, but you, so there, right there, she's smelling a board, and then I just have a little case, and she probably has some visual, a visual impairment because she noticed she bumped that. But she's mm -hmm. using her nose to search for things, right? So you probably could fast forward this a bit. It just kind of gives you a, an idea of her motion, and then watch for her arousal as we start to. And I'm showing different things you can do. This is a toy. There's various things, and you can go crazy with that. Um, buying a bunch of different puzzles, which is nice, but you can also do things that don't cost as much, right, for your dogs. To help build confidence, there's a snuffle mat where you can put food in. So, and I'm talking and she's like, okay, hurry up, you crazy <laughs> lady. I need some food. Feed the puppy, right? Okay, and I'm showing all this, blah, blah, blah. But these are some of the different things that are out there. Uh, and I don't know when I get to it, but let's look at that one. So there's a cone there. I just put some treats there. She's like, hey, I can't reach the treats. But see how she can't maintain yeah. a stand and getting it right. And her legs are spread out in front of her to help her balance. So I'm like, hey, the thing's in here. But 
even though she is physically unable, it's still an Im imperative that we still provide um, that for them, right? They, they still need stimulus. And, you know, I'm learning. It's kind of crazy. So my mother's going through some physical things right now. And pain exacerbates behavior huge. And yeah, and it, and it does. It makes behaviors more intense. And um, and it, it never really dawned on me because I work with dogs and then dogs in the shelters. But even that, she had a hard time sustaining. See how, yeah. and then her left hawk kind of like, uh, hyperextended there for a minute. And I said, can you stand on this cushion? So unstable surfaces are much harder for her. She only offered the front feet, not the back end where the back feet, where she had a physical, physical problems, but she's willing, right? She's yeah. willing and she's interested because she wants stimulus. I miss yeah. that dog so much. So you guys, one of the, and this is one of the things and, and, and Joanne can, that's why nose work is so great for older dogs. Not that you don't <coughs> you don't have to compete in it, but it's such a good mental stimulation for them, um, and um, and you can adjust the, the searches or the the hides uh, depending on their physical situation or their age and all that. It's such a nice mentally stimulating. Uh, yeah, I mean. Well, it's like anything, right? Their body isn't like us. As we age, it's not that we're not physically willing. Our mind is there, right? And and I think we miss that, right? <laughs> we totally miss that. Like, <coughs> yeah, it's, I don't know what the heck that is. And there's different things you can do. Like you can take towels and roll them up and put That's treats exactly. in it, right? Yeah. But see that? She was like, oh, hello. Yeah. I put a sock or something. I don't know. So yeah, yeah she was having a hard time. <laughs> she was. To... And she started to pant, right? <laughs> right. So and I pushed her longer for this video just because and bad my bad, right? I mean, those are things that and then I was trying to show different stuff. She's like, Hey lady, I'm still hungry. Just throw the thing down. Loser. I'm old and hungry. <laughs> it's what we do. <laughs> You're a loser. Hurry up. <laughs> so He's like, oh. oh. <laughs> God. She was like the best dog. This is a dog who came, and this is interesting. So, and Nancy knows this. We were at, um, she came to class, and she was, what, seven or eight months old. And they had a three and a five-year-old, and she was socially intolerant. So she was snapping at the kids. And she's like, well, how do I get her to stop snapping at the kids? I'm like, well. What are the kids doing? <laughs> <laughs> right. And so... <laughs> So she's like, you know, what do I do? And I'm like, well, she's really kind of not socially tolerant. And maybe the kids having kids around isn't the best thing ever. It's not that she didn't like them, but when they got into motion, she wanted to hurt them. Right. And she'd nip the heels and she would do that to us. When we go pick up poop, she'd like follow around. She's like, I'm going to bite you. I'm going to bite you. And then she'd follow us around and stalk us, even Bruce. And then, <laughs> and she's socially intolerant in that, um, <laughs> It was a time he played the blanket game with her, right? And the blanket <laughs> game was here. Yeah. I was like, don't do that again. She'd lay on the bed and she'd hold, she'd take the, take the blanket into her mouth and she'd hold it with her paws and she'd look at you like, go ahead, try it. And so he's like, I'm going to get it. I'm going to get it. And then she bit him and he, she's like, oh, she bit me. I'm like, why would you do that? I told you who she was. <laughs> don't do that. Yeah, so uh, you can I see adore her. her. She's having a hard time doing. Yeah, she is. She's tiring, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, and this was much longer than I should have done with her for the sake of this, you know. And so these are the things that, you know, we learn from. And She's it's like, you just feed it to me. <laughs> I can't I lean over. Enough. I know. Oh, goodness. That's funny. Yeah. That is. She goes, just, just put it in my mouth. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> that's not too much. <laughs> So, um, so a couple of things that we've talked about. Do you have more video, Joanne, or are you good? Yeah, I have two quick ones of fire. If you want to see, yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's. This is um, this is more nose work related. So when I got this dog, uh, my border collie, she's really not a confident dog, um, yeah. and what we were working on was like, hey, can you? 
find a hide away from me. Okay. And so the hide was just right here. I mean, that's not that far, right? Um, and if you just watch her, she gets stuck in a loop. Like I can't, mm -hmm. I can't go away from you. Like I'm just not comfortable with it. Um, Right. So she, she just continues to kind of circle the same area, the same area, the same area. And so for all of you nose work people that kind of are watching, right, this should be one of those cues to you as well. You need to change something. Um, the dog's not making progress and you're just stuck in a loop. Right. Um, and so she she really it's almost like there's a magical line right yeah. across those two blue standards where she's like, I can't do it. Um, so if you. I'm noticing that she's she's struggling here, right? And it's been, I don't know, about 45 seconds, something like that. So I just changed positions. Like, hey, is this better for you? She's like, oh, oh my gosh, right? So just the change there. And she sticks even closer. And then once I have shifted, now she can kind of move away a little bit um, to find a hide, uh, right? Hey, yeah. So it's hard to watch because you're like, oh, that dog doesn't know odor very well. Yes, she did. It, it had nothing to do with finding the hide. It had to do with, I am not comfortable moving away from you. Right. Um, and so. And there's you, nothing wrong with giving support like Joanne right. did there. Yeah. She gave her really yeah. good support. She, she knew exactly when to step in. She let her try to work it out. And I think that's the, the sweet spot. Joanne knew kind of where, okay, it's time enough for me to step in. And she let her work it out as much as she could, and then she stepped in. That's the sweet spot of getting to know what your what, what your dog is, right? It is, and I'm going to tell you, right? This is three, two years later, two and a half years later. Okay, this next video now, especially in nose work, right? We all want to work the sexy stuff. We always want to push and work hard stuff. And I did boxes and chair hides with this dog for. I think almost a year. Right. And I did. Ju so just that movement that you saw in the last video, I didn't show her where anything was. I just supported her. Right. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to show you what that's created now. <laughs> the monster. He's a beast. So now <laughs> this is the dog that couldn't move 10 feet from me. Right. It just warms my heart to see this. And she's like, over here. Right. So she has no problems covering a room this big. Yep. That was 50 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet. Yep, um, she's got no problems like moving out away. You hang out there. I'll tell you where it is. Come give me a cookie. Um, so and again, if I would have pushed her or got angry with her for not finding hides or, you know, any of that, I, I literally had to take a year off and rebuild this dog to be able to get what I got today. And that I think is another big piece of building confidence, right? We want it now. We want it next week, next month. We have that trial coming up. We have, you know, whatever it is, we want it to be done quick. And there is no magic wand on this guys. You, you have to really break things down to the lowest possible way where the dog's like, I, I, I might struggle a little bit, but I can do that. Right. And support and, you know, let them know you're there. Just like, you know, I moved a little bit, Lisa pet her dog, you know, all of right. those little tiny things. We're just saying, Hey, I got your back. Just give it a try. Right. 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 Which is different from coddling. It's yes. very, yes. very different. You guys. So the other, so really quickly, um, cause I know we're, that, that went quick. Uh, I think, so how can you help your dog be more com you know, confident? Establish routines. And this is more important for if you have an anxious dog, right? Um, you know, allow for and facilitate, you know, play. Because play really helps the dog feel more comfortable and confident. Um, and again, it's, it's relative, right? Like, you know, I know you've heard Joanne and I talk about um, you know, Bam has certain playmates. So does Tango, you know, making sure that it's a good safe, it's again, safe, safe dogs that they can play with and or people play with you in a different novel environment, right? So play is not only with other dogs, it's with you in maybe novel environments. Um, 
learn how to problem solve. This is where nose work and agility and some of the dog sports come in very handy, right? And then celebrate, you know, the successes. Look at Joanne. Some people would say, oh, I would never spend two and a half years. But look at the beginning to this to this dog now. It's it's crazy. The dog is almost a different dog. That's how mm -hmm. that's what confidence building looks like, right? From right. beginning from the beginning to the end. And then um, help your dog master, just like Lisa and Joanne did. Supporting the dog, making sure, give them a chance to work it out. And then when they couldn't, boom, go in there and, and support your dog, right? Really, really important. They did a really nice job with, in different ways, right? Joanne didn't show her where the hide was. Like she said, she just moved. And the dog was like, oh, yeah, I can do that. Mm -hmm. Versus Lisa was more physical with the dog. And again, it depends on the dog, right? How that, right. How that works right. and what they find helpful. <clears throat> so, um, so that's, that's what I mean. Confidence building takes a long time, but when you do it properly, like in fire's case, it's really great. Right. Um, and then, uh, taking a step back sometimes is how you do it. Increase your communication with their dog. Here they put agility training, but it's any kind of dog sport. It's really, really helpful. It makes right. a difference. Um, and exposing them to new environments and a great way, you know, making and helping them work through it. And I'm going to, and I, I'm going to quickly mention it. Like you, one of the things you want to do is be able to give them, present them to novel, with novel environments, but also making sure that you don't over, like, don't flood them. Right. Should be short, quick. Like I did with my puppies when they were young, we went into Bass Pro Shop. We went in there, walked around for like two or three minutes and then left. That's all I needed. I didn't need to do more than that because, mm -hmm. of, because of their age and they weren't able to handle more of that, right? Um, so those are it, it, just taking it easy. Uh, like I said, go slow to get there fast, right? So Judy, Roscoe was a COVID pup. Well, um, and yes, sort of, kind of he was because he's 14 months, Joanne. Yep. So that's, to me, that's not really a COVID pup, right? Because he's COVID, because he's 14 months. So that He was born in 2021, right, Joanne, thereabouts? Maybe? Yeah, what are we in, May? So he yeah, would have been uh, March, March of 21. Yeah. So by then, puppies were able to get out more and do more at that point. So I don't really consider him uh, as a COVID. And... Um, yeah, you couldn't go to as many places or whatever, but he was still, they would, he would have still been able to get out and do more things, but the situation, you know, and it, again, it depends on the people, how they handled that piece of it. Right. Cause we don't know like how they handled it or what they did with him. So yeah. And, and to me after 2020 and 2021, we're still able, you're able at least to get the dog out to novel environments at least. Um, where in 2020, it was a little more challenging to do that because it couldn't go anywhere. Um, and like Mary Laurie said, walking the dog in the neighborhood with low distraction, that'll do, that'll do it. So one of the things is, one of the things we want you to take away is don't overwhelm the dog. Don't flood the dog. Take your time. And it does, I know sometimes it might seem like you're not making any progress, but you really, really are. You really are. Just doing it nice and easy and slow. You just want to make sure you progress it, right? Like you you push, you try this, then you're going to push it a little a little bit more. And it doesn't take very much, right? Yes, um, Deb, it helps you think about Mindy, you know, how she struggled early because we want them to get over it. And we just, I wish that would be that simple. And to be honest, sometimes it works out that way where the dog, you know, maybe you might, I don't know, put them in the water, let's say if it's a pool and they might be swimming, they'll be like, oh, it's okay. But but what if it doesn't? What if it does? that becomes a, a really very, very bad thing and they really don't like water anymore or whatever, right? Could be one of those things. I think my takeaway from this and the thing that I want people to realize is that you have to be your best self for your best partner for your dog. You have to be... You have to look out for their interests, not look at their your interests, right? I mean, we all have goals and stuff, but you know, I always tell people like 
you know, my mom wanted me to marry a doctor and here I am a dog trainer. Right. So like I am, I, am who I, I know. Right. But I am who I am. And we have to recognize and accept that <laughs> we are. some things we're going to help and some things we're not. And, and, and it's not a defeat if they don't turn out the way we want, as long as they're happy. Right. Quality of life is so much more important to me now as I get older than, then I think that we really take, you know, we really, we take that for granted. It's like, it's so important, like the autonomy, the freedom, recognizing who the dog is, reading their body language, who, what can we do to help them understand that they're safe with us and we have their back so that we can support them in whatever it is they want to do. Hey, I have a dog who, you know, I wanted to do agility with, he didn't want to do agility. He's like, it's too much pressure. I made it a thing. My fault. Sorry, bud. Right. And that was Fender. I'm like, sorry, buddy. You know, we're going to do something else. That's me. That's my problem. Not his, not his. And I think we have to, as, as dog owners and enthusiasts, we have to take that into consideration, you know, put our egos back aside because this isn't about us. It's about who they are and we need to accept it. And the truth is, there's so many things you can do with your dogs now, right? Mm -hmm. If one thing doesn't work out, you can do, there's a ton of things you can do now. Where before, you know, you, we were kind of limited as to what we did. But right. now we have so many options of what we can do and um, what we can play with and do, you know, therapy work. There's agility. There's nose work. There's barn hunt. There's fast, there's a, a ton of different things you can do with your dog. So maybe one thing doesn't work out, the other, something else may. Right. Joanne? I <laughs> And you. <laughs> and go. Um, so yeah, it's, it's um, it, I think, uh, you know, Sharon made a, made a comment. Every dog is different and can progress at different speeds. And it's so true. Like when I got fire, I, I love nose work, right? It's just become just the sport that I love the best. And, you know, I remember, I think I was talking to Nancy about it when I first took her and I said, you know, I don't care if we never compete or like we have to stay at, you know, the low levels. We never do NACSW. It's okay. Right. Whatever makes this dog's life happy and better and now she's like yeah we're doing stuff hold my beer <laughs> yeah, right? and but, you know, even to this day she still has auditory sensitivities that yeah. i can't help that i yes i have her on you know some supplements to to kind of help but there's nothing i can do about that and they there have been two trials now where there have been loud noises that thankfully uh, I managed to recover from, right? And I say I, because what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? The one was like, thankfully I was by a practice box and I fed her like 30 treats and she was like, okay, it's gone. I can, I can do better now. The other one was um, like a car backfired and she hit the deck and we were in the Aww. middle of the search. Mm. And I was like, do I call it? And I just, it popped into my brain. I'm like, okay, let's go back to the last hide we found. Cause if I hadn't found a hide yet, I would have been done. So let's go back to the last hide we found thinking back to her NW1 and it worked then. And sure enough, I just fed her a whole bunch at the hide she already found. And she was like, okay, I can, I can keep going. Um, but people make comments to me like, this is not even the same dog in life, not mm -hmm. even nose work, right? She is so people friendly and outgoing and like, she just wasn't like that when I got her. And now she drags me to people and she wants to be pet and she wants, you know, so it, it's, it's heartwarming to see like how she sees the world now just by taking it slow and waiting for her to get there. Yeah. And Joanne, right. She couldn't have found a better home because Joanne is very, very patient and Joanne was not attached to the outcome of, for that dog. Right. And when she said she really didn't care if she ever competed, Joanne means that like she would be okay if she would just, Hang out at home because you have to really mean it if you're gonna yep. be if you're gonna if you're gonna own that. So so and 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 look at the end of the at the end of the day, she goes, yeah, I like it too. This is great because I feel safe. We have a good time. Um, but that's what I mean. So sometimes it could happen, but you just have to really not be attached to that final, um, which 
those of you who do the compet competitive edge and uh, with that, that is a huge part of it, right? Not being attached to the outcome. It's, it's really, it really, and that's for everything in life, right? Not being attached to it. Because the more you're attached to it, the harder it's going to be. The road gets a little bumpier. So mm -hmm. anyway, <coughs> um, I hope you guys enjoyed tonight's topic. I wanted to, um, that's one of the things that we work on a lot with our dogs, ma making them more comfortable and confident in whatever we do and the dogs that we affect, right? Our client dogs, our rescue dogs, um, all those kind of things are really um are really important for the dogs that that are entrusted to us by you by you guys, as well as some of the rescues and stuff like that. So, um, and that's sometimes why we harp on it. I know I sound like a broken record sometimes, and Joanne and Lisa the same, but that's why. Um, so it just if this helps you kind of wrap your brain around that a little bit more, that that's great. Um, anyway, I hope you guys had a great weekend. Have a great week, and thank you for tuning in. Bye. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you.